My name is Larry Reagan. I'm one of the directors at the Center for Online Innovation and Learning, COIL. And I'd like to welcome you to our COIL Fisher uh, talk this morning. Uh, our guest is Belinda Tynan. And I, I did tell Belinda I was going to have to get these. The names they use for positions are a little bit different, so bear with me. But Belinda currently is Pro Vice Chancellor at the Open University in the UK. She tells me that's a VP type position. But she's also transitioning, and her new position will be Deputy Vice Chancellor of Education at the Royal Melbourne Institute of Technology. So she's uh, end of April leaving the Open UK uh, and, and moving back to Melbourne, uh, Melbourne. Did I get it right? Melbourne? Melbourne. 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 Uh, Australia. So, and that position is much more in the academic side. That's more like a provost. Um, I've known Belinda for three or four years and have had an opportunity to hear her speak and engage around ideas about online learning. Uh, one of the things I so appreciate about her experience is she's always a year or two ahead of me. So I, I love learning and, and listening to the ideas she has. So welcome from Penn State. Welcome to our Coyle Fisher Talk. Well, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, all right, thank you for giving me a clap. <laughs> it's an absolute pleasure to be here. Thank you for inviting me to um, talk to you today. Um, there's lots I could talk to you about, about the Open University, but I thought that I would focus on learning analytics, because it's something that I've been very intimately involved with over the past year. So yes, um, I am a Pro Vice Chancellor. That is the sort of VP role, and, I, and in my current role, I look after um, the library, a skunk group that's called the Knowledge Media Institute, which is a research group and full of very clever people, the Institute of Educational Technology, which is full of data wranglers who I'll talk a little bit about in this um, talk here, um, and a huge production machine that looks after all the, the content, the materials, and the media of the university. I'm also responsible for um, all the academic input into FutureLearn. And I also look after the BBC relationship, and I produce 25 productions a year with the BBC. It's the sexy part of my life. We're very lucky. So yeah, I'm about to move on. I'm actually in transition. I'm moving back to my hometown in Melbourne, which I'm very excited about. Uh, a little a step up, so a little bit more responsibility, and looking after the curriculum size and shape of RMIT as well. So if you're ever sort of swing through Melbourne, um, RMIT is right in the middle of the city. It's an incredible university. It's architecturally very interesting, and it sort of hugs the, the inner landscape of the city itself. In fact, it, it sort of is the heart of the city. Maybe you'll visit me. But look, I'm going to talk about learning analytics, so I'm going to get on with that. I'm happy to be interrupted if you like. Um, I think that we could, we, we're a small enough audience to be intimate, so if you sort of have a quick question or want to ask a question, throw your hand up as we go through. I'd really appreciate that. But I think we also have time for questions afterwards. Now, am I speaking too fast? Can you understand me? You're OK? Yeah? I have some translation issues sometimes. You know, I say lift. I think you say elevator. I say toilet. You say bathroom. You know, there are all sorts of nuances. Um, I just came from Texas, so I've, I've learned to say, you all. <laughs> I don't know. I might get there eventually. I think I need a few more diphthongs in my language. But I'm sure I'll say some things along the way and you'll think, what is she saying? I'm sure it's just a translation issue. So if you need a translation, let's sort of check that out with each other. Does that sound OK? Good. All right. So this is what I'm going to cover today. I'm going to take you through our approach of how we're looking at learning analytics. I'll talk a little bit about why it's important to have good quality data, and in particular, understanding why definitions are so important. Um, look at the different models of student support that we offer, the impact around learning design in particular. Um, I've just sort of picked two examples out of the batch of things that I could pick. Um, so I'm hoping that will be of interest to you here, because one of the things we've found at the Open University that learning design has a much bigger impact on the success, successful learning outcomes of our students than probably we've imagined previously. And there's nothing like having a lot of data to put in front of faculty academics. Um, to actually convince them that, hey, if you did it this way, you're more likely to have successful students. And in fact, along the way, I'll talk about you know, a happy student is not necessarily a successful one. How our students have been engaging with learning analytics, and particularly our work around the ethics side of what we're actually doing. And then towards the end, just a little caution for us, because this is obviously not the panacea. And currently, you know, learning analytics is very hot at the minute, isn't it? It's a very sexy topic just in itself. 
um, we've actually been playing in analytics for a very long time in all of our organisations. But it's been more recently that we've wrapped a new framework around. So we just, I have a few cautions at the end in terms of moving forward. But let me tell you just a little bit about the Open University and what our mission is. We're called the Open University because we're open to people, places, methods, and ideas. And primarily around the people is the big distinguishing factor for us. So all the students that come to us, um, most of them do not have a college level degree or um, I think it's, I'm trying to get the equivalent, the A level. So the A level for the UK is similar to a college diploma, I think, before you come into university. So most of our students don't have any qualification at the high school level before coming into university. Most of our students are in fact working um, they're, and they're part time. But we're open to all of those students, which is very different to the other 129 universities in the UK um, who all have criteria for entrance, which is typically two or three A levels. Places, well obviously the Open University is a distance education organisation. We don't teach on a campus. We have a beautiful campus, but we don't actually teach on it. The only students that are on our campus are our 2,500 PhD students who may, may be there because they're working in the laboratory. But even some of our students are off campus at the PhD level. And obviously methods, from the very early days where we were broadcasting on television at 1am in the morning and our students would stay up late and watch us right up to what we're doing now with FutureLearn, um, where recently we launched the largest MOOC that's been seen of about 280,000 students with the British, um, British Council, which is all around English. And obviously ideas. Um, I was explaining to some colleagues at breakfast this morning that people may not be aware that we actually are a research university as well, um, and that we rank very highly in the equivalent research exercises in the UK. And in fact, recently we were responsible for designing the little bits and pieces on a space probe that actually landed on the comet, which was called Rosetta. We actually did send something up into that was called Beagle that got lost with NASA, and it recently woke up. Unfortunately, it can't send us any data back. We do a lot of data science. We also do lots of other research around, you know, the sniffer dogs for cancer, um, religious studies, music, all sorts of things. So we've, we play in ideas as well. And our scholarship at the university informs what we do as an organisation. The scholarship around learning and teaching is particularly important and it keeps building the quality of what we do with our students. So I'm going to talk a little bit about baseball as well through this presentation, which is always a little bit risky because you might ask the question, well, what's an Australian from a UK university doing talking about that? Well, I think there's some parallels where there's actually two films I'm going to draw upon here. Uh, one's called Moneyball and the other one's called The Curve. Um, I don't know if you've seen either of these films, but they, they have two distinct views around analytics. It will, it will be fun for us to play with. So I'm going to introduce you to the Oakland um, athletics team. And I thought that they were quite interesting. I watched the movie and the book. And well, I've tried to read the book actually, but I got through to about chapter four and gave up. It was, um, it's really a hard slog. Um, full of lots of statistical and extra detail about baseball that I just frankly thought, do I really need to know this? But the film was absolutely fantastic. And, this, um, and it's this group, the Oakland Athletics team, that inspired the story that sits behind Moneyball. And they seem to be pretty close actually, the story and the film, so you may well have another view of that. But in 2002 they had an incredible um, ooh, baseball season and, um, and that's all due to um, how they sort of started thinking differently about what it would take to win and actually having a plan for winning. So how did they actually do it? Well, they rethought how they would select their players and they use analytics to do that. And this is the form, well this is a formula that I have adapted. Basically what they discovered is that they needed runs, they needed to buy runs. They didn't need to buy hits per se. And the formula that underpinned this enabled them to think about how they would actually select the players um, that they could afford because they had no money. They had no money at all. All the other teams were paying millions and millions and millions of dollars for these players. But the Oakland A's had no money to do that. So they had to do to rethink you know, how they actually recruited their players. So what I've tried to do is say, well, if we were to break analytics down into a similar type of formula, then this is what I would come up with. That learning analytics would equal the problem and the question, multiplied by the data and analysis of that, 
divided by the interventions and obviously the ethics. So the, a lot of the talk that I'm going to give here today looks at well, what problems are we trying to solve with learning analytics? Do we even know we're asking the right questions? What data do we have access to? Quite often too much, but it's not always clean data. And sometimes that data is in warehouses which have different definitions. So how can you use it? How can you rely on it? And then how do you apply any analysis to that to find the answers that you want? And then finally you get down to the practical end of it. Well, okay, so now we understand what's going on, but what are we going to do about it? What are the interventions going to be? And then the really big questions. Well, are we acting ethically? And again, this morning I was talking about that because someone has, well, you know, I repeatedly get asked, well, how do you know what you're doing is having any impact? Because we're not doing A-B testing. Because there, for us, there's an ethical question that sits in that, that, well, why would we not give this group something we think could help them, whereas we give it to another? And so that's part of the ethics that we have to grapple with. It's very hard for me to answer the question, well, what has worked and what hasn't? because of that. But we are starting to play with A and B testing as well, so I'm happy to talk a bit about that too and how we've broached the whole ethical area. So what was their problem? They say if you wait 30 seconds, someone will put their hand up. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. They just didn't have the cash. They couldn't buy the players. So if I was to problematize the open university, I'd start here. And I think I alluded to some of this early on in my introduction around the type of students we've got. They haven't got A-levels coming to us. We've got 20,000 students that have got declared, a declared disability. Our age, is, our age group is lowering. We're a distant university. We would have expected, well we did four or five years ago, the average age was 35 years old. It's now 27. We're now attracting this new market of earn as you learn. They're not a market we particularly want. They're not a segment we're particularly interested in. If you're 18, we say go to campus, go and join your, your, your mates and have some fun. Go and do that. That's not what we do. But increasingly, younger ones are coming to us and that age is coming down. And we might even see this year that will probably slip down to 25. So they're a group we now have to think about more carefully. 18 and 19 year olds and under 25s in the online environment are much harder to look after. They require a lot more attention and support. And if you're a male, white, aged under 25, you've got even more issues to deal with. Most of our students are working full or part time. And there's even a percentage that have no formal qualification at all. Now we sit on a, anywhere between 200 and 215,000 students annually. That's what we're dealing with. We are working at that scale. So if I was to ask you, what is my problem? What might you say my problem is? Larry might ask. That's one problem. I mean, if you start to unpack all of this, you say, well, there's all sorts of issues and challenges here. And probably I'd like to rephrase and say, well, this is not my problem. This is my challenge because this is the university that we are. What if we would, what if we would understand or try to understand where all these problems or issues are coming from. Maybe there's a common cause. And if we can tackle that, we can solve all the problems in one swipe. Well, I wish it was that easy. <laughs> but you're absolutely right. There are a whole pile of things sitting behind this, and I'll get to that soon when I sort of talk about all the different success factors. But for me to understand what the challenge is here to help these, this group of students be successful is I have to actually understand them and their behaviours. And what would a successful student look like from this group? That's really important. So, what we did at the Open University when I arrived, in fact, my, my Vice Chancellor at the time sat me in his office, it was one of my very first meetings with him. And I said to him, like you do in that sort of naive way, so 
what do you expect me to achieve in the first three months? You know, a nice opening question. The question when you don't know what to ask because you don't know what you don't know. What do you want me to do? He goes, sort out analytics. Oh, okay, I can do that. No worries. No worries, I can do that. And so I pulled together what initially was a real ragtag bunch of people who seemed to have a stake in analytics. Initially, it was a group of about eight or nine people that I invited to a meeting. In the end, it was about 30, 35 people who sat around this table who all said they had a stake in analytics at the university. It soon became apparent to me, yes, yep, yep. Learning analytics and predictive analytics, because yes. the title, you introduced your talk with learning analytics, yes. but I feel like this is um, more in line with how I think of predictive analytics. I think we'll probably see there'll be two, two approaches to this, so I'm going to roll into predictive analytics and talk about learning analytics as well. But I'm starting okay. off at the institutional level now, so I'm sorry if I confused you there. So I'm just taking you from the institutional helicopter view and then I'll take you down within it. Thank you. Is that all right? Absolutely. And then if it's still not clear as we go along, just keep asking me the question. So with all that sort of 30, 35 people sitting around the table, it became really apparent to me that the organisation had lots of different things going on. And so in marketing there were analytics, in the library there were analytics, down in the faculty level there were people doing experiments with learning analytics. They were looking at learning design, for example. There were people in the institutional strategy area who were doing sort of the analysis on how many students we might expect to have turn up and what market segments they would come from. Um, so there was so much. There was the VLE. That's the other big sort of data point. So all these different groups, all doing different things. Nothing really joined up. No sense of what we needed, you know, in terms of a data warehouse. And so that green aspect down there, represents this whole area about data itself, what data looks like. So what we agreed with that 35 odd people was that we needed an organisational strategy for this. We needed to be more connected, we needed to be more joined up. That there was space for everybody to do what they were actually doing, but it needed to be connected. So I wasn't going to write in and say, well you're just going to do it this way now, but it had to be joined up together. Because we have a limited resource and a certain amount of money to go around and we've had some pretty serious issues and challenges that we need to deal with. So what are we going to focus on? So one key area we all thought was, well, the data itself. We needed a good architecture for it to sit within. We needed a single source of truth. We need a set of data definitions that everybody can agree with. So we had huge arguments and still do actually around when's the start of the year? Is it when a student registers or is it when they become active, or is it when they pay their first fee point, or is it when they send their first assignment in, or is it at the end of the first year? When is the start point? Because that's when you will use that as your, your data point for analysis. And if you want everything to join up, you want to understand behavioural patterns, you have to know what that single source of truth is. So lots of arguments around that, but almost settled. Around that table were people who were doing you know, what I would call, they're my clever research people in my skunk group, in my KMI, Knowledge Media Institute, who are working out the predictive modelling, the models for how we're going to look at the data. But not just predictive modelling, a whole range of different ways of looking at data and testing that for us and working alongside us and giving us beta opportunities as we played in the data. So we're helping us explore it, rapidly prototyping so that we could use that immediately for intervention helping us interpret. This is where all our, our data wranglers are. The people that sit with faculty and say, well, this is what this means. You know, this is what these numbers mean. This is what, how, this, how this can play out for you. And this is what it means compared to last year's cohort, for example. Or this is what it means against the learning design that you've got going on now. And so those data wranglers, which I think is kind of a fun name really, very powerful in the faculty. They come from the centre though. And they can reach out to help people. And then on the right hand side, the purple area, you've got the direct interventions. So it's all well and good to have all that information and have good analysis of and know what it means. What are you going to do about it? 
And so we have several ways of that and we are using a model which is based on Schoen's um, reflection model which is around four action, in action and on action. And what we've added to that is the, the four action which is not part of Schoen's model. Schoen's in and on action you would know very well. But four action is something we've added which is we've put the predictive layer at the front of it to say well we can predict what might happen. So if I look at my class and, we, and the data wranglers are, are looking with a, an academic, a faculty academic member and say look the segments in your group are males aged under 25, you've got 15% um, disability students. You can start to see what you could do in terms of understanding your cohort. Now most of us would say, well once upon a time we got the form, didn't we? That had all that information on it and we would know who our class was. But with the predictive analytics, we're able to understand that in ways that we hadn't really imagined before, which means that that class teacher can say, right, I know I've got that kind of student in my class. I can now do something now rather than waiting to see a decline or, or behaviours that change and then having to do something. So that becomes a very powerful part of the, the three-part wheel we have for intervening with analytics. Well, we're taking a two-pronged approach to the development of our use of analytics to drive up student success. We're tackling some of the infrastructure and policy improvements that we need and we're piloting new tools and approaches to identify strong case studies to influence further adoption. We're working with the departments responsible for managing the data and our Institute of Educational Technology and Knowledge Media Institute who bring their expertise in analysing those data and creating actionable insight. Of course, this is all done in close collaboration with the faculties and learner support services who can contextualise that insight and use it to improve the learning experience for our students. We're already starting to see people think differently. Analytics are being used to prompt quicker responses to improve the learning experience and to support students in real time to help them through those tough, critical moments in their learning journey. I want to introduce you as I go along to members of my team because I think the reason why this program, I believe, has been quite successful at the end is, is because of the team and get that 35 people around the table who all bring a different skill set that are absolutely important. So they're a jigsaw that all connect together. So I can stand here and say this is all wonderful but actually there's a whole team of people that sit behind it that make it happen and without them we wouldn't have what we're actually doing and getting them all together was a very important part of the change process that has occurred. And as I was saying before, using this as a framework also gives that sort of an academic integrity to the model that we're playing with here. So you'd be all very familiar with that, you know, reflecting after the event. Um, you probably have um, student surveys of some kind that you do and so you use that as data. You probably use your BLE data of some sort. So you would be probably looking at those things and reflecting on how you might improve something for next time. So we're all familiar with that. We've had that for years. That's a form of analytics. And that reflecting while doing, you know, sitting, standing here in front of you as a, as a teacher, you know, I, I'm constantly scanning the room. I'm, I'm constantly seeing who's interested, who's looking. I'm, I'm eyeballing different people and trying to get responses, trying to understand what's going on here. And in a moment, I'm changing what I'm doing. That's what a good teacher would do. And so, you know, I don't mind that you're using your machines and your devices as long as you occasionally maybe look up and maybe look interested. <laughs> but I would say, please, use your devices. You might as well. You could look things up as you go. And isn't that what our students do anyway now? Okay, so you probably know more about baseball than I know. But it's all about the scouts, isn't it? You know, from all the movies I've watched, it seems to be in the old times and even now, it's all about the scouts who go out to the fields and they're watching people, seeing how they hit, sometimes listening to click, whatever it is. Every, every scout seems to have their way of doing it. And it's all done a bit on gut feel, quite biased as well, you know, with the prejudice that sort of sits around that. Um, but at this point, because they didn't have the money, they had to really think quite differently and ask different questions. And so the question that's being asked here is that, well, is $7 million worth paying for the runs that I need? And really what they're asking themselves is that, well, actually, maybe I can pick a different kind of player if I know what makes runs. So I need to understand that. 
and apparently there's this whole baseball book, it's a stats book. And around that period of time, sort of, you know, late um, nine, you know, 1998, 99 and 2000s, there was this just a book which produced all the, all the statistics. Quite hard to make your way through. And what the Oakland A's did was actually create a program which would actually start to analyse that, to spit out, well, which players would actually make the runs, because what they had to buy was runs in a sense. Similar for us, what questions do I need to be asking about my cohort? And one of the challenges that we have with our students, as you can imagine, and it's a challenge with a lot of online and distance learning, is retention and progression. So everybody comes in with that great aspiration, and that's what I, when I was saying to you before, that you know that's our opportunity, that's our challenge. Our students come to us motivated. It's up to us to keep them motivated if we can, to keep them on that journey. We're an open university. That's what we are. That's our challenge. And so the questions I need to ask are really, well, how do our students learn? What makes them successful? What are the behaviours that will get them through and let them reach that, reach that aspiration? And then that cascades a whole bunch of other questions that I need to ask. So, you know, what, what is it that we can actually measure? What can I validate? And what evidence can I, can I provide for the assertions that I make? And what impact does it actually have? on the student experience, which is probably the hardest question I have to answer. Because we often have multiple interventions going on at a single time. You'll have faculty doing something, you'll have the organisation doing something, and then you say, well, which intervention is actually making a difference here? And then what does good learning look like for that cohort of students? And how do I know what that looks like? We have access to a wealth of information about our students that's held in our core university systems. We can use information about how students historically have performed and then model how students with a certain set of characteristics might perform on their current study. And that can give us some really useful early warning indicators of where students might benefit from extra support to give them better outcomes on their study. So the kinds of data that we have access to are sorts of the sorts of things that you'll see up here and lots more. And bringing that all together is an opportunity for us to understand how our students actually learn. Um, so there's, there's an enormous amount of information and trying to sift through that and find out what's important is, is what I've probably found the most difficult in trying to bring everything together. Because there are too many, in a sense, too many challenges here to deal with all at once. Yes. Thank you. In the last video, I, I'm not sure if I saw it right, in the background of the lady, when she was shown in the profile looking somewhere, there seems to be a folder, uh, a file folder that's called Problems. I found it very interesting that you have an actual folder that probably contains problems, right? That need to be solved. Well, we do have problems. Um, I think every organization has problems. I think it's the way we frame that, and I prefer to sort of spin it and say, well, these are the challenges or the issues. But one of the problems that we do have is getting those students who have, um, you know, come to us from those varied and diverse backgrounds to reach their aspiration, that they come to us believing they can, and we say to them coming in, we believe you can reach that aspiration. So we, we immediately are problematizing the kind of segment that we have coming into the organisation. So yeah, I would imagine probably in your office in a drawer somewhere you've probably got a folder that's literally got, this is the list of problems in it as well. But it's good that we articulate them and know what they are. But we, you know, as we look at the data, we're constantly unravelling other problems. You know, I was sort of talking to someone um, also about, you know, the sort of three, three things that, um, that sort of frame this. So you've got situational um, issues, institutional um, impacts, and then you've got motivational dispositions. And those three areas are a talk all on their own. But in a sense, when I'm looking at this, I can say, well, there are some interventions that sit around this that are institutional and organisational level. But there are situational ones I can't necessarily control. So if somebody's a carer, or if somebody loses their job, somebody gets a promotion, someone's mother dies, things I can't necessarily control. And then there's the motivational areas, which is the area that we actually put the least resource in, but it's the area that will reap the greatest rewards. But it's the hardest one to actually understand. 
So our statistical modelling sits around a whole range of factors. It sort of goes to what you were sort of saying, asking me really, is us really understanding what student success looks like. So sitting underneath these five boxes are 30 factors which we've identified through a range of different means in terms of analysing the data about what student success actually looks like at our university, what makes a difference, which then helps us understand what we can do and what we can't do. We protect the quality of the data that we process by three main principles. The first by ensuring that we have consistent data definitions across the university that are used by all management information units. The second by having quality control processes in place to compare and contrast the data as it's processed. And thirdly, having one single point of contact for a person who is responsible for the integrity of our data and has the seniority to be able to make decisions about how data is managed and in particular how new variables are processed. The OU is uniquely positioned in the quantity and quality of data that we capture. The challenge is to provide meaningful analysis and insight from that information. We do that most successfully by using advanced analytical techniques to synthesise the data and come up with macro level findings which we then use module and qualification teams to validate those findings. So as I was saying before, the range of interventions that we use are wrapped around the framework, the Schoen's framework of in, on and for action. Um, and we use a range of different areas. And maybe this is speaking to what that lady asked me before, as we start to sort of dig, dig into um, what we're actually doing at the organisation with all the data that we've got. Um, I'm not going to talk about all of these things here, but just some of them. So the OU framework of interventions, for example, um, the Mills interventions, is actually an institutional framework um, where we, we actually have set times and dates where we send reminders and messages to our students. And that's all based on our knowledge of how students behave in the system. So our students are very much driven by payments. I don't know how it works in the US, but our students pay basically three payments in a year. And at each payment point, um, that's actually a pain point for them as well. And so we can use that point to understand what their behaviours are at that point. We can see whether or not they're submitting their assignments, for example. And we can send them instant messages or we can give them a phone call. And based on the cohort of students, we have a different intervention that we would do. We have student support teams that are distributed around the country, which are based on particular discipline areas which is quite different to other organisations for student support. And so we'll have one team which is based on, say for example, science. It's based in Manchester, actually. quite a large team, team of people, you know, and what happens is students all around the country, it doesn't matter where they are, if they've got a question or an issue with science, they ring that support team and they've got a one-stop shop. So that's a very powerful team for doing interventions. And they can actually watch what those science students are doing and at an institutional level they can do things like, oh, this student is not submitting their assignment, we need to understand why that is the case. They can do a whole range of different things. In the student support teams, we've got a framework of support for students that follows the student from their student journey right from registering the modules all the way through their qualification. Even before the module starts, we use different analytical methods to identify who will be our most vulnerable students. And in most cases, we use proactive calling to identify what those students should be doing to keep them on track. When the module starts, we've got different analytical methods to identify students who appear to be at risk during that module presentation. We use the student support tool to send targeted interventions to these groups of students in an effort to retain them throughout that module presentation. So a really important thing for us then is to understand where those intervention points would be. And so a lot of our pre-work is understanding the behaviours of the students and using different models to do that, which you've heard about before. We then have a set of interventions that go into play which have messaging or conversational content to them, which we also evaluate. So very simple examples of these types of things, which are instant messages almost, that go out to students which are very attractive. We're then able to evaluate these, in the, and we measure everything, everything that we do very, very carefully so that we can understand the impact of 
In my role as a data analyst, I analyse the effectiveness of interventions that have been made to students by student support teams. An example of an intervention is an email that has been sent to students to help them get started with their studies. These analyses are then used by student support teams to make decisions about the type of support that they will provide to their students in the future. An example of an analysis is whether a student opened their email and then went on to click on the link in that email that takes them to further support and guidance. Now I've got examples of this that I can show you and you're very welcome to, you will obviously you've got the slide set so you can sort of an analyse this further yourselves but this is a, a real live unit. Um, it's a very simple set of interventions we do at an organisational level but only one set. And Belinda, move on quickly. how you yeah. analyse? Oh, I'm sorry. Um, we have a question online just for oh, good. clarification. The, the, uh, would you define VLE? Oh, virtual Learning Environment, and maybe you call that LMS? Or LMS, yes. Learning. And then VLE tracking would mean the data inside the generated Absolutely. by. Absolutely, yes. Okay. And not only just clicks in terms of what students are doing, but also the content within the VLE as well. Okay. Thank you. So I'm going to move on to the stuff around the VLE activity and the predictive work around OU Analyze, um, which has been developed by the um, Knowledge Media Institute. And this is like that 35 people sitting around the table. This is another group sitting around the table. They're our research skunk group. They do really interesting, exciting things. Big research players. Um, but their they work in analytics um, and really about, they're doing something at the moment in Milton Keynes called MK Smart. And so they're setting up the analytics to make Milton Keynes a smart city. And so they're, they're taking the work they do there and moving it into learning for us. So I want you to hear from John. OU Analyze was developed here at the Knowledge Media Institute and has already been used by 40,000 students across the Open University. OU Analyze makes use of the fact that OU courses have thousands of students at any one time. So when a student is taking the course, they're treading the same path that other thousands of students have taken. You can imagine that a student interacting with a virtual learning environment is similar to someone playing a game of chess. They're making moves, they're reading materials, they're watching videos. Some of those moves will lead to success. Other moves will lead to failure, failing an assignment or failing the whole course. What we do is we compare the moves that a current student is taking to previous moves that previous students have taken. If the path seems to be leading to failure, we then try to move the student to the most successful path that's closest to them. So put simply, all of these dots here are all the learning activities and events within a module which is a component of a program. I'm not sure what you'd call that here, a course. And what we can see is how students engage with the components of, of that course. And we can see whether or not what, what parts of the course are leading them to pass the module or pass the, the assessment, in fact, because we do it on the assessment points. Um, whether or not they're even going to not submit that work for us or indeed if they're going to fail. Now, this is what it really looks like which is absolutely impossible and we would never give that to a faculty member. But the analysis, the, the program that's sort of the algorithms that sit behind this help us understand in multiple ways what makes, makes a successful journey through the, through the course itself. So it's quite sophisticated. And so we can actually work our way through and say, well, a student who's two thirds of the way through, you know, um, some courseware, we can, we can tell you quite early on whether or not we think they're going to fail not submit or pass that assignment. That helps us in a number of ways. This not only helps us with staff before the students actually, you know, submit assignments or, you know, what, you know, whether they're going to pass the module, but it helps us in our learning design as well. Because it means we can pick up specific learning activities and say, well, this learning activity is helpful, but this one isn't. Or we can say to a student, hey, you've skipped a learning activity which is likely to help you be successful. Well, why don't you go back and do that one, which is what we do. We recommend to students a successful journey through this course is if you do these things. So you saw in the video this snapshot. Now, this is the snapshot of a live screen. Down at the very bottom of it, you can see the green dots and the red dots and the, the orange dots. These, this is where our predictive work actually starts to work. So every academic sees this. They don't see that other messy fingerprint. They see this, which is a much nicer view. And it would take some time for me to interpret it all for you, but basically on the top graph there you've got last year's cohort, this year's cohort, how the current cohort is tracking, 
what the predictions are for submission, what the predictions are for students passing and what the predictions are for students failing. It then goes down to the student level, so down at the bottom here, these are all individual students. And what happens here is the staff tutor can look at this or the academic faculty member can go, right, what's going on in my class? And they can begin to adjust what might need to happen. They can put interventions in place. This then results in an activity was recommended that also fits on the back of it. So a staff member can, can do their own interventions with their, with their module team or their program team, or they can use this tool as well, which will automatically give students recommendations about what a successful pathway might look like in their study. So OU Analyze has been an incredibly powerful tool. We started off with a very small group of about 20 um, teams of, of staff members, and now every semester we've basically got about 90 teams knocking in our door saying, we want to use this tool because we realise that we've got some problems with some of our students here not completing, not submitting. We need to understand the pattern. What can we actually do? And this is a homegrown tool. It's something that we've developed ourselves. I wouldn't say it's overly complicated or sophisticated. Any clever group of people who know about statistics and analytics would be able to put something like this together. But let me let a staff member tell you how it's helped them. Learning Analytics has had some very positive outcomes in the Faculty of Social Sciences. We've used it in two ways. We've used OU Analyze uh, to help us identify those groups least likely to succeed and to contact them prior to the course and at key points in the course. Uh, and then on the specific course that I look after, uh, we contacted them between SA3 and SA4 just to check how they were going and if they needed any extra support. Uh, and all the evidence suggests that those telephone calls have had a really positive impact on performance. So just to give you a sense of what happened for this particular tutor and how they used it, we tried to localise the application of OU Analyze to tutors who want to be part of understanding how their students are learning and to improve that learning experience. We want them to control the, the interventions, so it's not up to the institution to say this is what you'll do, because quite often the academics and the tutors, they know their students and they know that cohort better than we actually do. So let me talk now about learning design. Click to that quickly. So we have a whole range of tools that capture the learning designs that we, we have for our students, being a distance and education organisation. Um, we're very methodical about it, very applied. And so these are the kinds of tools, and I'm happy to share these further if you like, where as you're building your, your, your presentation, you're actually putting in that information into this tool, which then helps us analyse the successfulness of the design itself. And so it goes right down through to things like, you know, you're defining what kind of tutor support there will be. So we don't leave a lot to chance. So the academic staff are, you know, preparing content in different ways and learning activities. And they might be assimilative activities. They could be assessment activities. A whole range of different things which are put into this tool and logged so that we know what students are actually doing. Then the tutor support is defined as well. So we say, well, what do we want the tutor to do when students are actually learning? What's their role in the classroom? Are they going to be doing online discussions, online forums? Are they going to be doing wikis or blogs? Are they doing a face-to-face? -face? Are they doing a virtual classroom? What kind of um, approach is being taken to that learning? And we capture it all. What it then gives us is a visual representation of the learning designs themselves. Don't expect you to be able to fully see this. But on the most left-hand side column, we, we use a term called assimilative. Now that's, that's, that's content that students are maybe reading or looking at, viewing. You know, it's, a, it's more passive. It's being delivered to you. The next one on is finding and handling information, which you might expect students to do. The third one is communication. The next one is productive. Are they producing something? The fourth one, the fifth one, sorry, is experiential. The sixth one is about being interactive and adaptive. And then finally, assessment. So we can start to see the weighting within modules of what's going on. And so on the very bottom one here in the right-hand side, you'll see that the law module is very assessment based in its design. Whereas the one in exploring science is more content based in its design. And the one in the middle on adult and healthcare, you've got in the middle there the 25% on being productive, students being productive. So we can actually see, we've classified it in our way, and of course you know other people would adjust this and make their own classifications of it. But you can get a representation of what's happening. So when you analyse that, 
this is what happened. Learning design is the way how teachers design our courses. It's an essential blueprint of the student's learning journey and it is really essential to understand how students are doing certain learning activities throughout the course. Our analysis of 157 modules at the Open University indicates that learning design has a fundamental impact on how students are learning. The way how teachers design their courses influences how students are learning throughout the module. It influences their experience and it influences their retention. What we found in our analytics research using cluster analysis is that students who have courses with lots of assimilative activities really like those courses but at the same time are less likely to complete. Thus it is very important to look at how teachers design their courses and providing a way for students to learn in different ways. So in our research what we found was that a happy student is not necessarily a successful student. And so while they might like us to stand out the front and give them things and they might like to read things, actually it turns out that student retention is less because they're not being as interactive as they could be. Now we've learned that from our research on, based on our student cohort. And so I think you know another really important message here is that analytics, whether it's institutional or learning, analytics need to be organisationally driven because context varies so much. Cohorts of learners vary so much. So the circumstances that you deal with are very different to ours and you may find a different output from this. But having the ability to analyse the actual learning design itself means that when we sit down with our academic staff and say, look, actually we've noticed that retention in your module is really dropping off, let's have a look at the learning design. We can now look at this learning design and say, hey, look, we can actually prove now people that if you have this type of learning design, your students are more likely to be successful. That's very powerful. So I did say in my little blurb that I thought was delightful. So, and I think it's really important to celebrate the things that sort of emerged that probably we should have expected, but they're the unexpected outcomes, aren't they? So bringing everyone together. I guess when I had that first meeting with the 35 around the table, I just sort of thought, you know, heaven help me. How are we going to do this? How are we going to get everybody on the same page, but at the same time feel really valued for their individual contribution and what they could give to the jigsaw? And so, for example, giving that work to the skunk group to work out the modelling for us. Everyone didn't have to do that, but give that to the experts. Ask the researchers to do it for us. Getting the data analysts you know, out of the information service area. Bringing the statisticians together. Getting everyone out of the table. And now they work as a fantastic team. We really do. We're all in different part in departments. I, ha I oversee it all, but I don't lie and manage all of these people. But we all work together. That's been unexpectedly successful. And the students are aware that learning analytics is being used and that has been demonstrated in a consultation process for the setting up of the ethics policy and students were involved in that and that creates a bit of transparency so they know what's going on and why. Um, in my role as a student representative, I know that students are being made aware that the, the learning analytics is being used and why it's being used in order to provide them with targeted support at the times of stress in their studies when they need it. So for example, when an essay is due or perhaps when exams coming up or perhaps when life is a bit difficult for them, then they can get that targeted support in order to make sure they get the right support at the right time in order to help them continue with their studies. Now we didn't script her, but she managed to mention both the motivational, the organisational and the situational aspects of what we're trying to do. So we've worked side by side with our students. It's been a very important part of what we've done. You can find the ethical framework on the web. It's open source. You're very welcome to adopt it. In fact, people are adopting it all around the globe at the moment. Um, and, but if you do, we just appreciate knowing that you, you have. Um, but we're very proud of it. It has eight aspects to it and again I'd really encourage you to go and have a look at that. Um, and the woman who's been in charge of this, Sharon Slade, um, is somebody who would welcome any discussion from anyone here who wanted to talk more about ethics. Well understandably there's been a lot of interest in learning analytics over recent years around the positive things that we can do with our student data to better support students and guide them towards their study goals. And at the same time, the university has become aware of some of the ethical issues around the uses of learning analytics. For example, the harvesting, the use and analysis and storage of student data.
The university was aware that the increasing uses to which student data are being put were not adequately described within existing policy. So to that end, a new policy was commissioned so that we could start to explore and describe the ethical issues attached to some of our learning analytics uses. The resulting policy is based around eight broad guiding principles which describe the university's values to using data to shape and guide students through its student support. You're welcome to go and, and find that. And just to finish off, because um, there's lots I could say, is just sort of bring you back to our institutional overview again, just by way of just sort of summarising hopefully a journey that I've touched on for you to give you a sense of what we've tried to do at the Open University. Um, and what's going on underneath. Um, there's an awful lot going on and I'm really happy to connect anybody here with anybody in this team or, or with the work that we're doing. Um, there's a very active learning analytics um, community. I don't know if you've heard of the LAC community or the SOLAC community um, that we can all be engaged with as well. But hopefully I've given you a trip through how, how we approach it at the organisational level, dipping down into deep dives into, oh, you analyse the predictive work that we do, the work that we do around learning design in particular, which is very powerful. And if there was one area I'd say that, because as I'm leaving this organisation, they keep saying to me, what should we do, what should we do next? I'd say the singular focus for me now would have to be around learning design. Especially in the online and distance environment, I think that's really powerful. That's where it's all happening. And if you can, if you can sort that out, then I think you're on to a winner. Thank you. Rose? Thank you, Belinda. A uh, question with regards, and, and I've got some insider information obviously with regards how long this has gone on, but could you give us a sense of how long this took to do and what the critical stages were for you as manager of all this? It's taken us three years um, to get to this point. Um, and I think the critical stages, well, number one was being to make sure that you get the right people around the table who have a stake and not to underestimate how many people that might be, um, right from users and students right through to, you know, the IT director, having the right people around the table. I think the next big thing for us was understanding um, what data we had, where it was, and getting it into a data warehouse and having a single group. And in parallel with that, was really trying to say, well, what, what were our challenges and what were the opportunities for us in terms of enhancing that student journey? So what were the success factors? We needed to understand what was the successful student journey going to be like right? and getting that work going. Now, because we had a team of people, we were able to say, well, the information group, the strategy group, you go off and figure out what that is. Now, while the research group are going to look at the predictive work, so you had multiple things going on at the same time that made up the jigsaw. It relied on that group of people being open and transparent with each other and not being territorial. But I think that was about also having um, an institutional leader, someone who's high up in the executive of the organisation sponsoring it, saying that this was important. And then the rest of the executive sitting beside it saying this is actually very important. Um, I think along the way it's needed a lot of rewards. It's not been easy. You know, the arguments that we've had around just defining, you know, when do you start? Who owns the data? Which department is that going to sit in? Some of those territorial things were actually very challenging for people um, and challenging for me too because I didn't manage them. It's a soft, it's influence management. You know, it's not like I pay their salaries and can tell them what to do. Other people do that. So I was trying to make this sort of part of the culture in a sense. So it's not been an easy journey but it's one that's been quite successful in that we celebrate everybody's contribution along the way. And even this presentation is a celebration of all those people who have been part of it and that's been an important part of the messaging that I can stand up front and be the front of house that actually these are the people that did all the work and they need to be on, on display. I hope that's helpful. So Herbert, then we'll come up with my well, Thank you very much. This is very inspiring. Uh, I'm wondering how does marketing fit into what you call the jigsaw puzzle of learning analytics and learning design? 
Um, well, I guess they're, they're probably at the start of that journey when you start to talk about segments of students and types of students. And so when I sort of use terms like, you know, the, the under 25 white males, the, the disability students, the, the, we have a, a black and minority group as well. Um, there are segments which our marketing team chase. And so they are at the very front end of the journey or, you know, the start of, the, of a learning journey for us. And so that they actually um, are collecting the students based on an analysis of market of what we want in the organisation. So they come at the very front part of the journey for us. And, and I guess, you know, if you, if you think about when we talk to them and say, well, look, you know, these students are more successful than other students, they could actually point their marketing in other directions if we wanted them to. But that's not the kind of university that we are. Um, but as I mentioned at the beginning, you know, the, um, the 18 and 19, you know, this is a whole new segment for us. We're able to give the marketing team advice when they're talking to students. So we can say, look, when you're talking to an 18 to 25 year old, you need to say, you're likely to be studying for 10 or 15 hours a week. That's the level of commitment. So we can actually feed back into their processes critical information which then helps the students make better, de better decisions and So, so I understand the idea that you um, take things within your university and make it really specific to the university, but um, the question I have is what was the motivation behind building a platform yourself rather than looking out to the market for something that exists? Um, I think because we had a really motivated team of people that understood the context we were in, not a lot of the product three years ago really met our needs. And so by adopting something else, you know, I guess, you know, more and more institutions do that and we do that a lot too. We adopt technologies and all the time rather than build our own. But in this circumstance actually, we were able to build something that is not actually that expensive to do and it's become part of our business. It's not a project anymore. It's just part of the job. It's what we do. We've just shifted the emphasis in what we do. We also have, like I said, some really clever people in analytics research within the organisation that can help us with this. Um, our specific problems and challenges around pretension and progression are particular issues we're exploring through our analytics framework. They won't be the issues that other And working at the scale we do, much of the product that was available wasn't actually available at the scale that we'd actually Could you... Um very impressive and <laughs> very inspiring as well. Could you share a little bit about uh, what you talked about the ethics uh, with A-B testing and do you have any students who actually opt out of data collection? Um, the way I, when our students come into the university and again this is all on the web so you can pick up all the policies um, that you know for our students and all the information pages for our students as well so feel free to grab that. Um, we are walking down that path where we're probably going to allow students to opt out. One of the problems or the tussles we've got currently is actually with the marketing group um, and also because if students opt out of that then we can't actually help students who might need help and we need that data in order to understand their behaviours. So we're in sort of a catch-22 with it. But we do want to give the students the opportunity to opt out if they want to. So we're still playing in that space whether or not we will let them opt out. Um, it's still under debate. But on the very front page when students come into the organisation, they're actually um, given quite good information about what they're signing up for and you know, how their information is actually going to be used. With the A-B testing, um, what's happened is because we've got so many groups doing so many different things, it's very hard for us to unravel, well, is this thing that's being done here, like that direct marketing thing working, or is this thing with, you know, a module team working, like that staff tutor, what he's doing working. So we've got too many things going on all at the same time to understand which thing is actually making the difference. And so it's hard for us to understand where to put the resource exactly because so much is happening. So what we've started to do is to pull apart some of the interventions. And with some groups, we're saying, um, you know, the principle of do no harm. You know, what interventions might we do with this group but not with that group that's not going to 
do harm. So we're gently looking at the process of A and B testing in some areas. Try and get underneath it because we think we could refine it much more and we think we're throwing too much resource at too much intervention that's not giving enough impact for us all, you know, back to the university. So Belinda, I'm going to jump in and represent uh, some of our 30 participants right. online. Um, so, so a question has to do with um, asking you to repeat the names of the learning analytic community. And I, I think they're asking for what kinds of people did you have who, who came around the table in that, uh, in that discussion about the learning analytics? Okay, so we had um, the director of IT, the Information Technology Services, the, the chief you know, I'm what they call them in a CIO, mm -hmm. uh, is someone like that. Um, we had um, data statisticians from the, we had like a, um, what would you call it, an information office, mm -hmm. um, which does the strategy for the university, so an information office person. We had um, people who were staff tutors and academics and faculty who were heads of programs or heads of courses, mm -hmm. so the head of the Bachelor of Science degree, for example. Um, Within a faculty, you know, we also have associate deans learning and teaching. I don't know if you have those people here. Um, they're, they're a bit like an associate dean research. There's a structure within a faculty, so we have those sorts of people there. Um, we had researchers, and so I, I wanted to bring the researchers to the table. I think the thing that always disappoints me about universities is that we usually have fantastic research going on, but we never use it ourselves. We go elsewhere, but we don't use what's within, so I wanted to use that group within. Um, a centralised support unit, which we call um, Institute of Educational Technology, so maybe that's like COIL, I'm not sure, um, but it does academic support for staff, so professional development type people, data wranglers. Um, it, I could probably give you a full list if you like, but it's almost like representative of almost every unit in the organisation that had their fingers in data of any kind. What strikes me is it's a mix of both the academics and the people in uh, informatics and people in the IT side. Oh, yeah. and it really takes that combination yeah. to come together. It was both professional staff as well as academic staff mm -hmm. because a lot of the work we're doing are with students and so you need to have your, your faculty around the table as well. Yeah. They need to be engaged in these conversations. Good, thank you. Shannon? Yeah, I actually have a number of questions. This was fabulous. Um, but could you tell us how you're tracking um, the, this initiative, the success oh, yes. of it? I did actually miss a slide. Um, we do have an evaluation framework that sits around the whole thing. And so every single thing that we're doing. So I, I think I gave you one snippet of that of the data analyst who's analyzing the student support team interventions. And so there are analysts that look at all the things that we do. And we have an evaluation framework um, to, around that. And that's part of that challenge I was saying to you around trying to unpick which intervention is actually yeah. making the difference, you know. And we've really struggled with, well, if we think it can make a difference to the cohort, we will do it to all cohorts, not just some of them. Larry, can I ask another? No, oh, please do. Okay. Yes. Um, did you have resistance from some pockets of the institution? Oh, any yeah. segments? And how did you? Oh, so yeah, it's yeah, sort yeah. of a leading Where question. Where they were. Yes. I, oh, yeah, yeah. I assume you had some resistance. And oh, yeah. how did you um, help? Those segments over. We even had a rival program start up. We even had another group who was round the table, mind you, who secretly <laughs> set up a whole other new dashboard with new data wow. feeds and everything. Yeah, I had to shut that one down. I had to grab that one. But it was so secret that I didn't find out about it until my vice chancellor said to me, "Oh, and by the way, you know, did you know so and so is growing tomatoes?" And I went, "Oh, really? How interesting!" Pretending I knew all about it, trying not to. <laughs> and then I had to go and figure out what it was. But actually it was quite senior people who'd come together with another senior person and put together something quite separate rather than work through the institutional program. It was interesting because it kind of demonstrated to me that we hadn't quite cracked that total senior layer. In fact, we cracked underneath. We went right down and under here did really well at the core. But we hadn't quite cracked at that top level. Now, since that happened, since the Growing Tomatoes group went off and grew their, you know, cherry ripes, um, they have now come back into the fold. And in fact, the strategy office has now decided to own the complete set of dashboards, which mm. includes the Growing Tomatoes bit that went into it as well. But underneath in the university, um, even with academics, we had a lot of trouble, um, mainly around their capability, the, you know, understanding what data meant and then what to do with it, not having the resource. 
So they'd sit in front of you and say, well, okay, thanks for telling me that, but I don't but have no any money. Sure. I don't have anyone to help me to fix this, so what do I do? So, you know, in that, because we were sort of still prototyping and beta typing what we're doing, that's now moving into the organisational model. I was explaining to Larry this morning that we've approached, the, the next wave of this is, is approached through KPIs, key performance indicators, and at the very highest level of the university. So I set the learning and teaching KPIs for the university, which includes progression and, and retention and qualification completion, um, you know, student satisfaction, assessment feedback, all that stuff. That goes right up to the vice chancellor, and that's his KPI. And so he then cascades it down to his vice president team, which includes uh, you know a set of executive deans, and then that flows down through the organisation. So whilst we started it over here as a project. We've now managed to influence it and bring it into the organisation as a set of KPIs. It's now unavoidable. It has to be delivered. But there's been a lot of pain, and I can give you many other painful stories. Verification. Just as a follow-up question um, with what Larry has just posed, um, you mentioned that you include a lot, a lot of support from an administrative part and uh, technical support and also department support. So are there any voices from the students who can um, like influence the decision making and uh, decide how the uh, learning analytic tool is being designed or used? Yeah, one of the first things I did was put a student on the group of 35. And so students carried through with us through the entire journey. And so they're our greatest supporters. And so they helped us build the ethics policy. They sat around the table with us and helped build it um, so that they could um, have a voice in the whole decision-making process of analytics. They were also then a very powerful support. So as I took the program through the Senate of the university and around the university, I had student support behind it as well, um, which was very useful. The next stage of our program, if I was staying, um, would be the completion of a student <laughs> dashboard. We've started building it. Um, so it's already in play and it's integrated into the VLE around a range of information that would, would help our students understand their learning journey. We're just conflicted at the moment around students might be depressed by their journey. Yeah, that's my concern <laughs> too. Like, my next question about this would be like how student perception would be in front of this learning and analytic results. Since Lima had a different interpretation and uh, have some trust or like accuracy issues on whether it represents themselves well. Well, that's that's part of our challenge in what do we show students, you mm -hmm. know? And and I still come back to that it could be quite a depressing journey, and it, we need to be careful what it is that they might see. Like they can already see their grades and what their grade average is going to be, so they can already see that. And so they've got, there's a little tool that kind of will help them understand what, what they're going to get as their final output, even for their degree. Um, so we already have that. But we probably want something that's a little bit more instructive as a dashboard that would say that, you know, that would might, you know, as in terms of like artificial intelligence, like an intelligence thing that might say, hey, we've noticed you haven't done X, could you do, you might want to go do this because it would help you be successful. A bit like our, one of our tools there actually has a recommender on it. Mm -hmm. We almost need like a dashboard, I think, that's going to go down that recommender path. Mm -hmm. But this is where we're at the moment. We, we undecided. We're not sure where to go with it. Okay, thank you. But it's our next thing. So if you've got some ideas, please. <laughs> yeah, I, I think that would be good if there could be some kind of dialogue between the students and the yeah. designer for this tool so that there are constant or iterative feedbacks that help design this tool better. Yeah. So we have another one, um, Blinda, if I can Good. represent from online here. Um, our uh, colleague Jerry is asking a question I think that has to do with um, the idea of uh, learning design, back to the learning design aspect, which you said in the end is really a critical piece of, uh, you know, trying to reduce the, the waste in our learning design process, you know, taking the things out that, that aren't contributing to the yeah, outcomes. Yeah. Of how, how do we measure that? How do we know that we're being effective with these new strategies? And, and I think related to that is a, is a question around the granularity of course content. Yeah. So, so all of these pieces and parts, because I, what I'm taking away from your talk is the idea that it's almost a flexible learning design process 
Whereas right now we go in with a somewhat rigid structure of the curriculum in the path and what's going to happen in the, the next eight events of learning, if you will. And you're kind of suggesting, well, let's watch the first two, see what happens. And we may need to make an, an adjustment here, an altercation, a different path or whatever. And I, I, Jerry's question is like, how do you know in the end or how, do you, how are you learning which of those are really most effective? Again, it's that measuring it as you go along. Um, the way our materials and learning experience is designed, it's, it's, it can be anywhere between sort of 18 months and two years to get a course ready to go online. So there's an awful lot of design and research that goes into it to get it to that point. And then it has a life. So, you know, this is the business model because you've got to not forget the business of the organisation. Mm -hmm. And so it's then it's worth between five, seven or maybe ten years of life. So it's it's... It's a difficult thing to go in and say, well, I'm going to pull that bit out and then put another bit in. Mm -hmm. That's another expense on top of it. You want to try and get it right first time. If you can. So the subtle adjustments we make going along, that's that reflection on action, you know, in the cycle I was talking about for in and on. And so that, that's sort of looking back. So at the end of every year, you can see what has happened and you can look back on it. But the just in time, so you're watching it now and you're saying, oh, my goodness, you know, this assessment is failing. You know, we had like an assessment recently, 70% 70, 70 of the students failed it. But they passed, most of them had failed the ones before, something wrong with the assessment. They were able to go in and fix it. In fact, we just pulled it out and didn't count it. The assessment. Students didn't even know. It uh, strikes, strikes me as though the role of a learning scientist in this process yeah. is, is critical. Absolutely. You yeah. need a pedagogue's head while you're looking at the yes. data. So there's, there's, a new, there's a new profession. This is a new job. Yes. You know, this is, this is somebody who's a pedagogue, a learning designer, mm -hmm. and an analyst, all together in one role. Yeah. This is a new person yeah. in, in our world now. That's what's striking me, and I know I've got colleagues, Bart and Kate in particular here, who are thinking about how to do this. And I'm, in my mind, I'm, I'm trying to extrapolate who in our community represents, where's Kyle, these kind of folks, you know, um, are we... When we think about organizing a team like this, who do we have around the table who have these different kind of skill sets? I don't have an answer. I'm just, mm -hmm. I think it might be worth a conversation internal. Yeah. But that's where I would say, though, that the jigsaw is that you don't have to have that skill set in every single person, but you need to have the skill sets that can work together. Yeah. And that, that creating the team that are prepared to plug in you know, and they're a whole different type of tribes, you know. Analysts are very different to statisticians. And IT people are very different to pedagogues. And so you've got all these tribes of people and the way they think. And trying to get those people to think somehow together, you know, is, is the opportunity, I think, to do something different. But I'd also suggest that, like, instructional designers, you know, and educational developers, the new world is this new person. And that's what the courses have to do. So whatever training we're giving to those people, I think it has to change because learning design has become far more sophisticated mm -hmm. than talking about Bloom's technology or the mm -hmm. ADI framework. Sure, sure. Uh, thank you for sharing this, Belinda. This is really, uh, really good stuff. And I have a question, I guess, sort of centered a little bit around the data. Uh, so a lot of early efforts, at least here and, and other places, center around the data that's, I wouldn't say easy to get, but easier to get, which are... Uh, clicks, right? Yeah. Different <clears throat> clicking patterns and access to information and things like that, especially in the online world. And we sometimes use that as sort of a proxy to try and get at learning. But the more you mentioned Bloom's taxonomy and the more you talk about sort of higher order thinking and learning, it's clear that text and communication via text becomes mm -hmm. radically important, right? So I was just curious, with that in mind, what are you sort of, uh, or the OU doing with that regards of leveraging sort of ri rich textual data and analytics, or what is sort of at the, the leading edge of that, where you, might you see that going in the future? Mm -hmm. um, we have lots of other people doing research on things. So I don't know if you know about Open Essayist. You might, yeah. Um, Denise Whitlock, I think she's out there somewhere. Um, but Open Essayist is one of those tools, which actually we give it to students. And students can use it to analyze their own text. And it helps students strengthen the syntax and the, the grammar and all that sort of stuff and the structure of, of sentences and paragraphs. Um, so it's a tool that we actually give to students to use rather than us using it as, you know, as an organization. So 
whilst I've described the organisational stuff and what's happening around learning behaviours, underneath that there's whole layers of people who are doing all sorts of other really interesting stuff, like you say. But Open Essays is one of the ones we're very proud of, that we put it in the hands of the students, the students to use, to help them improve their writing, especially at the post-grad level. And Denise would love to work with partners. So if there's anyone here who's interested in that kind of thing at post-grad level, she'd love to hear from you. And that tool was developed with Oxford University. We've got one more from Jerry, if it's okay. Um, and, and Jerry had asked an earlier question. I don't know whether I captured it right, so I've asked him to write it out, so I'm going to read it verbatim. Okay. Uh, in order to gauge design effectiveness, you've got to characterize design in a standardized way. It says, what are the design characteristics that OU tracks? For example, what can live inside experiential learning options from, from your slide that you put up about learning design? A whole bunch of things. And so that could be the open science lab, um, it could be something in the workplace, it could be a practicum. There's a whole range of things that make up those categories. Um, if Jerry's interested, which sounds like he might be interested in knowing more detail of that, yes. I'd, I could put him in touch with Rebecca Galley, my, my colleague at the OU, and you could unpack those categories even further. I think it'd be really interesting. Yeah. I think Jerry would be interested in that. Yeah, gonna, and I'm she'd love to talk yes. about it. She'd love to talk about it. Yeah, yeah. 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 That'd be awesome. Yeah. That'd be great. Good. Our Director of Technology Enhanced Learning looks after the whole learning design area and so they would be delighted to share. We're an open university. We're open on all levels. We don't have secrets. Thank you so much for spending time with us and with our Thank colleagues you. over the next couple of days. Um, this morning you talked about the fact that you have done all this work internally. And we talked about the fact that we've got contracts with Civitas and Pornicus. How did you build the capacity inside to, uh, to, to build that. this this process? We had um, additional resource. So it started off as a project. And so the Vice Chancellor gave us some money to start off with so that we could have some project managers. And we turned it into a project. Um, and that enabled us then to bring that 35 around the table and to bolster. So there's a team of about 15 people who have you know, orchestrated this process. They've sat in my office as the PVC Learning Teaching Innovation um, and that group of 15 have basically coordinated the whole thing. Um, with, with the proviso though that it would go by July, in fact it's now, it's already going to business as usual, we're ahead of schedule, so it's rolling back into the university. So they were more like a coordinating group to make it happen. We actually used the skill sets of all those other stakeholders and bolstered those areas where needed. So the researchers, they needed, um, in fact they used two research assistants to do the work. So we paid for those research assistants to do that work for us in that research group right. so that we weren't taking the resource from that institute fully. This year we only paid for half of one because they used it part of their own work and our and are publishing from this work. So in the journals, you'll see OU Analyze, it's out there in the research journals, three and four star journals, for what it's actually achieving. So that, that central coordination, a little bit of extra resource, having a very clear business plan about what the business benefits and returns would be, um, and then drawing upon that group around the university and just topping it up where it needed to be. Um, having the engagement of the um, upper management, senior management, and middle management was incredibly important to make it work. But um, we did have a lot of companies come pitch to us. Mm. You know, and we pitched back. Yeah. That's the money ball analogy, pitching. Yeah. I didn't I did okay <laughs> on the baseball. I didn't make any faux pas. No, you did a great job. That was terrific. Pass, you know. That was terrific. <laughs> I should have done, what was it, cricket or something. <laughs> <laughs> you would have lost us on that one. Did I answer your question well enough? I sort of feel it's unanswered. It's interesting that today um, EAB had a briefing on um, high demand jobs for graduates and the number one was data scientists which is paying $118,000 and here in America right now it's a real difficult 
in finding that expertise. And I was just wondering, do you have data scientists within your organization that you tapped into, or did you use your researchers, and how did you develop your algorithms? We had that? data sciences scientists within the university that we tapped, but we also recruited into the space. And so the group, which is now going to sort of be normalized into the organization, is some of those people that we brought in for the project have now moved into that unit. And as we've had um, people resign, those people have replaced what was there before. And so we've been able to create a new unit. We found it incredibly difficult to actually, we can get data analysts, can't get statisticians. They're really difficult because statisticians help you ask questions. Data analysts don't do that. And so you need both. You need the statistician and the analyst together. So we've had to do both, build our own capability within the organisation by bringing some people in, but we also then tap the people within the organisation and they became or have become a community. Terrific. Any other questions in-house, Kyle? So congratulations on all the, uh, all the progress and, and for, thank you for sharing with us. It sounds like you're only a small step away from allowing people to uh, sort of move individually uh, and sort of breaking away from a competitive mindset where exams are scored on percentages and that's your one shot and then you move on. Uh, how close are you? Are there any conversations about sort of a more competency-based approach and uh, you know, doing things that aren't sort of, that are designed to support learners all the way through the prog process uh, rather than sorting them periodically? Um. I think we're probably a fair way from personalised, although we do have something called assessment banking. The students can be halfway through a course, bank that assessment, withdraw, and then come back next year and, and pick it up again. So we do have you know, mechanisms like that um, which, which help support the students. But in terms of whether the students can have choice about types of assessment, no, I'd say we're still probably very, um, very much a very set. But, you know, we're dealing with 200,000 students. Right. You know, it's 600,000 phone calls a year. It's 90,000, you know, per, you know, every, every assessment point. So we have six assessment points for basically every right. module. That's why when you, early when you said, what's our problem? I was thinking your problem is scale. Yeah, but it's right. actually... So that's one of your problems. It's one, right? one of the, well, it's a challenge. Mm -hmm. right. yeah. It's the and challenge you, that we set with. And when you're talking about the average age being 27, again, average... It's with that many people, it's almost an opportunity to, to cluster that. Yeah, yeah. As you said, it's really about clusters yeah, yeah. of different people. And, and, and you so said that, an ideal course design maybe yeah, with yeah. the X percent in assimilative activities and Y percent mm -hmm. evaluative. Maybe that's different for different clusters of people. Mm -hmm. And so maybe there are opportunities, if not to personalize, to uh, clusterize. Yeah, yeah. And we have thought about that. So you sort of think, well, you could have a class full of like 65 to 75 year olds. But actually, they may want to learn with 27 years. There's this whole diversity thing that goes on then, because we have the whole thing around international students. Well, they learn a particular way. Well, we'll just cost them over here. So then you start to create learning ghettos. And so it becomes quite, you know, it can become even more challenging than that personalization of right. things. Um, I just think that it's a very dynamic space. It's great that we're asking you know, all these questions, right? Well, that's, this is part of like asking the questions. And that's why, in your context, it's so important to understand your learners and what success looks like for them and what it means, because then you can start to think about what the design is. And, you know, we've always had this sort of universal design thing where you do one design and it suits all. Well, that needs to be nuanced in different ways. We don't nuance to learning to learning style. We don't nuance to that. If you're, a, you know, audio or visual, whatever, that's it's part of our design process. But we, ask, we will start to nuance more to segment, you know. But that nuancing happens from the academic in play. So when, when they're doing the four predictives analytics, they say, oh, look who's in my class. Oh, I need to do a bit more of this. I've got a lot of 18 to 25-year-olds here. I need to spend more time talking to them because that's what they will need to keep motivated. Thank you. My pleasure. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get the last question in. So the last question is, as you were facing this three years ago, you may not have known this at the time when you started, but looking back now, what do you think your, your biggest challenge was in moving this initiative forward? Was it cultural? Was it um, institutional? Was it uh, technology? <laughs> or, or was it all of that? It's all of that, but it's always the people. Mm. 
it's always the people. You know, it doesn't really matter that the data is messy. So that doesn't matter. That goes away if people are talking to each other. Mm. You know, so it's all about the people and getting people to trust, to understand it, to see the power of it, to un you know, to see what its impact could be. Mm -hmm. You know, and you know, it's been quite nice this just this year. You know, we put the call out for you know we have a hit list actually. You know, the twenty worst performing modules. Um, we didn't have to have a hit list this time because ninety people put their hand up and said we want to come work with you. You know, this that's a tipping point. It's happened. Don't need a hit list anymore. But people are now thinking in a different way. So that's been very powerful. Mm -hmm. It's been such a pleasure to work at this organisation actually, and to be able to do this. And as I go to my next one, I'm going to do it there. Sure. I'm going to do it there. I'm going to RMIT, I'm going to do it there. It's I'm very excited about it. Uh, mm -hmm. we, we best w wish you the best in your Thanks. next endeavor. Please join me in thanking Belinda. Thank you. You've been a great audience. Thank you.